actually, I was thinking about this later. Like, what if they just decided, you know what? I'm not going to kill myself. Like, oh, the time's coming. Are you guys going to choose? You're not going to choose? All right, we have to kill Ron here. And then Ron's like, well, wait a minute. What if we just don't kill me? Would the plague still happen? Or would it not happen? What would happen right. if he didn't? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Movies Are Spiritual. We are discussing the M. Night Shyamalan film, Knock at the Cabin, based on the novel The Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay. So we're looking for spiritual themes in this movie. I don't think there are any. Oh, you don't? No. <laughs> Let's just skip this one. No, this this one had some pretty obvious spiritual themes. M. Night often explores his view of God, faith, spirituality in his movies. You can see that all the way back to his early films. And Signs is a good example. So here we are again. Knock at the Cabin will show some spiritual themes, and we're going to try to figure out what M. Night is trying to say with them. So stay tuned. Post your comments. This is kind of an open dialogue. I would like to know, what spiritual themes did you guys see in this movie, Knock at the Cabin? Apocalypse. Yeah. So, like, revelation type stuff. Pretty much that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. straight up. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can look at, as we get into it, we'll talk about more, but, you know, what you would do for your family, people you love, what would you sacrifice, things like that. But, yeah, this is a straight up, you know, four horsemen, apocalypse revelations just a little twist kind of what he said you got the apocalypse coming there was a scene where they had a giant flood the sky falling i mean it was pretty obvious watching it you can pick up on all that stuff there yeah the sky falling is an interesting idea because i thought i read that ancient people were actually afraid of the sky falling and killing them at some point have you ever heard anything about that no, and I, I never understood exactly what it was meant by the sky falling. Like, I, I, I guess when you picture it, you're thinking, like, what, clouds are falling down? and you got to think of it way back in the day. I mean, before science, before sentences, things like that. Yeah, you, know, you walked into a cave, and the cave had something on top that you could touch. Well, then you walk outside, and you look, and there's this big blue thing that gets dark and blue again. I, it's too high. I can't touch it. So you maybe assume that the sky is your ceiling. And what if it breaks? What if it, you know, oh, I was sleeping the other day and a rock fell by my head. What if that happens outside? And, you yeah. know, a rock the size of Cincinnati falls. Well, that's basically it. In Old Testament period, people thought that the sky was solid. When you read Genesis 1 and it talks about the dome, that's what it's talking about. They basically thought the earth was like a flat disc mounted on pillars, and there was a solid dome sky over it. So there was water above the sky, and sometimes that dome would open so that the rains could come in, or in the case of the flood, a whole lot of water could come in. So that, that was their view. So I don't know if they thought the dome was falling. I mean, Which is ironic, because that's like the opposite the way baseball domes were. Close <laughs> when the rain starts. That is true. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> so here's some stuff I saw in this film. I know that M. Knight's view of God is not really coming from any particular religion. There's kind of a variety of different religions that he molds together to kind of make his view of God. But it is interesting how much biblical stuff there actually is in here. So we've got this self-sacrifice theme of living for a purpose greater than yourself. There's a lot of pagan religion influence. For instance, the pagan religions near Israel in the biblical times, mm -hmm. they actually believed that their gods would let their family live if they sacrificed an infant. So that's why people would sacrifice babies to the god Molech, and they'd put them on this like burning altar. So one life would allow the rest of your family to live. And I actually think that plays a pretty big role in this film because they basically expanded that idea to instead of, okay, if you sacrifice one life for your family, now it's one life for the whole world. Interesting. For, pretty dark. <laughs> and dark, yeah. I mean, yeah, to prevent an apocalypse. So they say. Yeah. Which makes the movie interesting. Yes. So you're not sold on the idea that there actually was going to be an apocalypse. Then. Me? Mm-hmm. 
No, I, I, I think there was. I mean, I liked how when the first two people died, you had the flood and then the plague. But both of those were also explained, kind of explained away, where it was like, oh, this this plague thing has been, you know, building up for a little bit, and, but now it's just hit big. And they knew about the tsunami four hours ago. You know, so they heard about that and they're using that to try to get us to kill each other. And so, yeah, the, with the first two, I was like, OK, what's the twist going to be? But when the planes started falling out of the sky, it's like, um, no, nobody knows about a, you know, a big EMP EMP. Yeah. These four people don't know about the Russian EMP that they just let off or whatever the case is. So I was like, no, nah, that's that's not a we're past coincidences now we're in the real time this is apocalyptic it's happening yeah that's about the point i would have gotten freaked out too yeah so you guys mentioned the flood story the flood was not an exclusive idea to the bible that shows up in sumerian religion other religions the epic of gilgamesh but there was another interesting story here which kind of mentioned revelation it's an apocalyptic book but there's a story in genesis chapter 22 in the bible that i think is also Maybe one of the templates for this. You guys know about the story about Abraham being asked by God to sacrifice his son Isaac? I do know that. Mm -hmm. It's probably, in my opinion, one of the most difficult stories to like come to terms with in the whole Bible. I have a unique theory on that story, though. Let's hear it. At the end of that story, shortly after, God makes basically a law that prohibits them from killing and from sacrificing, right? So if you think about Abraham's neighbors at the time of that story, the other nations around, they were pagan. They were used to sacrificing children, right? It's kind of crazy and scary to think about now because we would never do that. But at that time, the pagans, that's what they did because they thought the gods would let them live, right? Hmm. Well, Abraham was a pagan. So at the time that God asks him to sacrifice his son, I'm not totally sure if he knows that that's wrong. Because in that culture, that's kind of what they did. I've read some stuff about that. Like scholars are kind of split on it. Some will say, oh, his son was too old. He would have known that's wrong. But others are like, no, human sacrifice was a much more common thing than some scholars want to admit. So I don't know who's right. But if you think about it that way, God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. He gets ready to do it. And then this angel, who is is probably Jesus, shows up, stops him, and then puts an end to the practice of child sacrifice, right? Uh That story might be about ending child sacrifice or human sacrifice. And if that's the case, then this movie, at least the Christian and Jewish God, would not actually put a person in this predicament now. But maybe if you rewinded to Abraham's time, you probably wouldn't see something quite like what's in this film, but maybe this is supposed to be a modernization of that story. I don't know. What do you think? I can see it. Yeah. Take some liberties, move some things around. Yeah. Yeah. If you mix it with the pagan child sacrifice to prevent the death of a family, then you would kind of get this movie. Mm -hmm. That's my nerd out. (laughs) (laughs) No, it works. There are a lot of different depictions of God. I'm just wondering, in your opinion, do you think the God that you know would ever put you in the predicament that the family is put in, in this film? I would hope not. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like you got plenty of stories from the Bible and things like that. And maybe not to that extreme, but God probably throws things like that at our feet all the time. Just obviously, like you said, not to that extreme, but deal with this. How are you going to deal with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to that extreme, God, I hope not, please. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if he would put us in that position where we had to choose to sacrifice someone that we love or care about. I mean, I guess maybe not that, I don't know, maybe like not that direct where it'd be like, all right, you're going to kill one. One of you three have to kill somebody and then the rest of the world can live. I, I don't know if we'd ever be put in that situation. But as Doug said, I think there are, you know, like I'm a believer in like the free will. I believe that God will put you in situations where you have to make a choice one way or the other, you know, and then you, you choose. 
I know plenty of times in my life, I feel like I've been like at a crossroad. Like, okay, I've got to make a decision. Which way am I going to go? God put me in this position to make the choice. I'm either going to make the right one or I'm going to make the wrong one, but it's, it's my decision to do it. I think God could put you in a situation like that, but I don't think it would be demanding of you have to sacrifice and kill because last I checked, uh, we're not supposed to murder people, right? So in that, in that kind of what a sacrifice would be doing would be murdering. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't think we'd be put in a situation to that extreme. I agree with you. I don't know about other modern religions and what they would think. This might be closer to on par though, like I said, with ancient pagan gods, Molech, because people in the ancient times, sometimes they viewed their gods as hostile or they didn't know where they stood with them. Like if their gods were angry at them or they were going to kill them or something. So depending on what religion you're in, this may or may not reflect the God of that religion. But me coming from the Christian perspective now, I don't think that God would ever put us through this now. And I don't think he would repeat the Abraham Isaac predicament either. But interestingly, you want to know what the writer of the book, the film's based on, was trying to explore when he wrote this? He was trying to explore the idea of what if God is evil? Like, what if the creator of the world is evil? What do we do? And if he were to put us in a situation like that. So that's interesting. I don't think he's coming from a religious perspective. I think he had kind of identified, if I remember correctly, he seemed like he was probably kind of agnostic. I don't think he meant to be hostile towards Christianity or anything, but maybe just dealing with a fear of what if this being is scary, you know? I get that. And I don't take offense to it. He's looking at something from a different perspective. You know, it's not God is evil and look what he does. You know, he, I don't think he believed that. I, I would think any Christian you know, lying in bed, brain just going wherever. And you think, what happens if I died? I was wrong. You know, what? what's that going to be like? Or will it be anything? Will I just stop thinking one day? And there's a, so mm-hmm. much going on with it. But, you know, even though I think about stuff like that, I don't believe it. So I think that's the same way to look at this. You know, he's not attacking our religion or any religion. Uh, He's not saying religion is bad. He's just like, what if God was mean or, you know, bad and made us do things? I would be willing to say like 80%, I'd bet he is probably looking at some of those Old Testament stories with some concern, trying to figure out how to deal with them. I would guess that, That story came out of that, that type of wrestling. But M. Knight is going to take that story and he's going to say, you know, we'll get into it, but he's going to say something completely different about God. He's going to have a different perspective than even the writer of the book, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, to kind of go along with that and, you know, like him saying, like, what if God was evil, which I I, I don't believe that God is evil, but... I think, I don't know, we may have all been in situations, maybe we haven't, but I know I've had one within the last, let's say with just within the last year, where I, I mean, I had some serious questions about some things. And I'm not saying that God was evil, but I had to question why certain things happen. I don't know how Doug felt about this, but Doug and I lost a really close friend last year. Uh, he ended up getting cancer and it took him pretty quick. At the same time, I, my grandmother got diagnosed with cancer, and it was, just, it was just a bad year all around. But when it came to our friend, and, and it was rough for a while there watching him battle the way he did, and we all knew it was coming, and then it happened. And I actually had to ask, why? Why him? He was like a, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. He never had anything bad to say about anybody. He always was helpful and cheerful. And I mean, just an all around great guy. And it just seemed like he always had bad luck. Like no matter what happened, no matter every time he started getting ahead, something knocked him back down. He'd get ahead, he'd get knocked back down. And he never complained. He never complained. He always had a big smile and he's always laughing. And then he gets, he gets something going. He always wanted to write and direct. And they had a TV show that was getting made. And then he gets cancer. And I just have to ask why. Why him? You know what I mean? Again, not mm-hmm. saying that God is evil, but it just makes me sometimes question. I had to ask, why, why is this always happening 
to him. You know, I know people who have abused their bodies and they live to be 99 years old and this guy's done nothing wrong and he can't catch a break. And I don't think it was all his decision making either. Some of it may have been part of his decision making, but some of it wasn't. And I just had to, you know, so again, kind of going along with the lines of maybe questioning some of the decisions that God makes or puts us in some of the situations, not saying that he's evil, but, you know, sometimes you wonder, why are we in this position? Why am I in this situation? Why am I being faced with this? What did I do? You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's something that actually I kind of struggled with a little bit last year. I just I just couldn't understand it. I'd say most people wrestle with some dark times like that in life. It's fairly normal. When they say like, you know, there's always a reason, there's a there's a purpose behind all these things that you face. I still to this day don't know what the purpose is of that. Yeah. I don't get it. I think it. the best way to look at it is right now we're studying for a test. And I think we're studying pretty good. You know, we live our lives decent where we may not be multimillionaires and everything, but when we do pass on, hopefully we've done enough studying to pass the test and move on to paradise where those who mess around, they might have great lives here on earth, but if they don't pass the test, they're not going to have eternity. If you look at things like that, this 80, 90, 100, however long you end up living, that's nothing compared to eternity. That's, I mean, that's a good way of looking at it. I mean, it, it does suck. You know, like you said, I mean, I was, I was a part of that deal, that writing deal, and pretty much might be dead in the water. Who knows? But yeah, for his sake, I mean, that's just, it's awful. But I got to believe he's in a much better place now. You know, he doesn't have to worry about going to, deliver food for two weeks to make some money so he can get out to California to do this deal or anything like that. Now he's just chilling. Yeah. yeah. He knows all the secrets that we don't. He knows where the Mothman is now, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he was obsessed with that thing. And he knows if Bigfoot's real. Yes. That's the important one that I, I got to find. I, I can't wait to find yes. out. That's the way I look at it. Right. And I, I mean, I never lost my, my faith or anything like that. Mm hmm. No, I get it. And, you know, because I do struggle too. It's just like, why? But it's just I like, just, all right, this is nothing. This is just a bad day, which is not even a fraction of a percentage of a millisecond that's a part of eternity. So, right. Yeah. Let it go. Oh, yeah. That's just kind of where I, I guess I can kind of see where maybe the writer was coming from questioning of why I'm in a position I'm in, you know? Yeah. So, well, kind of tying into the movie here, I mean, my take on salvation personally is that it's, it's just about loyalty you've got god and then you've got satan and fallen angels rebelling so you you've got these two powers and the, the whole thing is just about which side you're loyal to right but the problem with that is that we live in the sucky place <laughs> like we live in the place where god doesn't really live fully you know mm -hmm. we're in the place with the fallen angels and all the broken stuff so this place is going to suck no matter what. But I don't think that God would put us in a test like in this film. Yeah. Maybe you go through tests or trials so you can know if you have faith or not, or you can know how, how strong you are in that. But I don't think it would be some kind of test like, here, kill someone, because if you do, I'll know that you're loyal <laughs> or I'll yeah. save the rest of humanity. But I, I do want to tell listeners, like wh whatever background you're from, that's just looking at it through my lens. And I don't really know how all other modern religions would look at that. But that's what we do here. So. Now, a question I had after the movie and, you know, we talk about what the family had to deal with and how they had to make that decision. Well, it's even bigger and worse for the four people that got chosen to be represented the horseman because if you oh, think yeah. about it i mean the first guy uh, ron weasley shows up and in this movie he, he we find out that he is the one that beat up one of the dads just because he was gay he is a straight up homophobic redneck of a person basically but what happened what what happened in these dreams that made him just show up and be like i'm here and i know i'm probably gonna die Basically, he's sacrificing himself for a gay couple. Is that supposed to be a redemption story because of what he had done? 
Uh, Maybe you could look at it that way. I'm just curious, like, what did they see? When you bring up the redemption, I'm trying to remember the other people's storylines, but, like, one was a nurse, one was a teacher, and the other one was a waitress. So it didn't seem like that they were doing anything that they had to be redeeming themselves. The, the teacher coached basketball, and it was just that first guy who seems like, if anything, he had something to do to redeem himself. I know when like they say, okay, now the time has come, and you have to make your choice. And if you don't make your choice, then he's going to die. We're going to kill him. And that brings on the first plague or whatever, right? Hmm. Actually, I was thinking about this later. Like, what if they just decided, you know what? I'm not going to kill myself. Like, oh, the time's coming. Are you guys going to choose? You're not going to choose? All right, we have to kill Ron here. And then Ron's like, well, wait a minute. What if we just don't kill me? Would the plague still happen? Or would it not happen? What would happen right. if he didn't? You know what I'm saying? Like, we kill mm-hmm. him. Now here comes the first one. Then we kill this person. Here comes the second one. Just stop killing each other. Why don't you guys all hang out in the cabin for a couple of days and see what happens? It must have been a pretty bad <laughs> vision because none of them had any second thoughts about that no they didn't hesitate they they did it so yeah it makes me wonder what did they see i i kind of want to read the book right now just to see if it goes in any detail about what what the vision was well that kind of tied into my question about these characters are we supposed to be in awe of them and their faith because that is kind of my perception of how m knight thinks i mean he wants us to think about living for a purpose greater than yourself. So I think we're supposed to be in awe of Eric and Andrew at the end when they make their choice. But walk that backwards a little. I think we might actually supposed to be in awe of the four horsemen. I think you have to be. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's kind of like how, you know how other religions go door to door, like Mormons and Jehovah Witness? Mm -hmm. I don't side with their beliefs, but I respect their faith because they get out there and they talk to strangers and that's scary. But this is like turning that up to 20. <laughs> yeah. And then some, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. You know, the, the thing with the people who come to the door too, you know, obviously going into this movie, I had no idea who these people were, or what they were doing, but I mean, you come to find out they're not evil people. They're good people. I didn't look at them as villains throughout the whole movie. I never looked at any one of them as a villain but they were definitely very devoted to whatever the cause that they felt like they had to do. You know, they had a mission and this is what we have to do. And I, and obviously they were thinking of the whole world, all of humanity. Yeah. I think you can have a little admiration for them for, for their devotion to that and to the cause that they believed in. Even though it's disturbing, right? Even though it's a little disturbing, you can still appreciate the fact that their faith and I mean, you could tell they didn't really want to do this, but this is something that they felt they had to do. You know, we're going to sacrifice ourselves, you know, unless you sacrifice one of yourselves and we have to do this and we're trying to save the world here. Mm -hmm. See, that's the discomfort with this movie. Maybe that's what makes it so scary because if this happened in real life, like I said, I would think, no, these people are wrong. God would never, ever ask somebody to do this. But in the universe of this movie, That is exactly what's happening, right? They're right. They are justified in their killing of themselves and their peers, right? Yeah. That's what's so uncomfortable about watching this movie is you're like, no, like, you know, it's, you know, it's wrong, but in the movie's logic and in the universe of the movie, it is the right thing to do. So there's really this, I don't know what you call it, cognitive dissonance going on. Yeah. Another way to look at it, and this would be if you looked at it from the author's point of view that God is evil. I was a fan of the show Supernatural. and Oh, that's my wife's favorite show of all time. And about halfway through the series, an angel shows up and basically he possesses a human body. And he talks about how the human body prayed for it and said, you're allowed to take my body. So I don't know if that's just story logic or if that's something that some religions believe or think of but if you look at it in that sense maybe god sent four of his evil angels down to possess the four people disguising them as the four horsemen just so he can play with this family that is a good question i don't know the answer because like what we talked about what demons are on some of the other podcasts they're the 
half human, half God children of the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. I don't know if an angel could possess someone. I, I mean, I don't know either. I've never heard of it, but I mean, you never know. If you are trapped in the movie Knock at the Cabin and you are faced with this predicament of choosing to kill one of your family members or yourself so that the rest of the world could live and to prevent the apocalypse, what would it take to convince you that this was really happening and that this wasn't just something people were gaslighting you into believing? First off, in the movie, they weren't allowed to kill themselves. Right, they had to choose. You, somebody had to kill somebody else. Yeah. Because suicide in that case, that's a lot easier. Personally, I think it started getting real to me. I mentioned earlier when the plane started falling out. So at that point, that's when I would believe and I would try to talk people into shooting me. Because I don't know if I could shoot anyone else. I'm the same. I think... A family member, I should yeah. say. Yeah, a, a complete stranger. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Shh. No. Um, no. Uh, Sorry. I would probably be the same way. I I think after seeing you got the flood, and you you think okay, it's a coincidence or whatever. Like he said, he had it timed. He knew when this was coming on, and then all of a sudden, now the planes are falling out of the sky, and there's a lot more going on. I think that's the point where I would probably really take them seriously. That okay, there is something going on. If I was trapped in a cabin with my wife and my kids, there's no way, no way that I'm sacrificing one of them. And I have a feeling that they would probably do the same thing. That would be a tough one. It's like, do you, because <laughs> if I don't decide, look, we're not sacrificing ourselves. We're not doing this. And then the world's going to have to end and we're going to be alone on the world. I mean, it's probably a selfish thing to say, but I'm almost leaning towards that. I don't, I could not kill or sacrifice anyone that, you know, anyone that I love, friend, family, I, I couldn't do it. So I'd be like, Doug, if, if, if this, anyone's going to get sacrificed, you're going to have to do it to me. Or don't, and we'll just live the rest of the world. Well, we'll is that live. part of it? Or you don't, and then, yeah, you stay alive, and you're, but you're going to wander the earth forever by yourself. Is that what they said? Yeah. Your family lives, but the rest of the world dies. Everyone else dies. You get to stay with your family. You guys have the world for the rest to yourself for the rest of the. Hey, that's not so bad, is it? <laughs> that might not be so bad. No, I feel so, bad for all the people that. Again, that's the other thing too. It's like there's a lot of lives that are being lost, and if it's just my life, the sacrifice for everybody else, I could probably go along with that. I would have to convince people to to do it. I couldn't do it. I don't. I don't think I could ever. I've never been hunting. I couldn't shoot a deer. I couldn't shoot an animal. There's no way I'm going to shoot a person or kill a person. I can't do it. It's not in me. I'm with you guys. I would be confused at the point when the plane started falling from the sky. But I mean, coming from my view of God, I just don't think God would ever ask us to sacrifice somebody from our family. Like, I just don't think he would do that. So I feel like I would stall and I would wonder if I was wrong, but I don't feel like I could act in that scenario. Especially, I mentioned that story about God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, but my view of that isn't really that God wanted a sacrifice. It's that he was putting an end to the pagan practice of child sacrifice that they were already doing when they worshiped other gods. So here comes God and says, okay, if you worship me, you don't have to do this anymore. I don't want you to do it, and puts an end to it. And if you view the angel that stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, as Jesus, which I think it is, and he comes down himself to make sure that doesn't happen. I don't even think he would test humanity like that again, because human sacrifice is not part of our culture like it was in the ancient world. So just the way I view God, I don't know what it would take to make me think I was wrong about that and then to act in that scenario. I just, I couldn't do it either. Yeah, I think at some point I'd be guessing, okay, you recorded this, you hacked into my TV to make this happen or something. Cause yeah, I, I don't believe God would ever expect four people to sacrifice themselves and to try to tell us that you have to kill one of your family members or something. Like that. Yeah. So it's a darker look at the apocalypse, which is already dark <laughs> the apocalypse. It's hard to know what we would really do in that scenario. Like if that really happened, like if I'm walking around, I saw a bunch of planes falling around. I probably would be trying to think of other reasons that they could fall instead of jumping to mm -hmm. this vision's solution because it just doesn't fit 
with my understanding of the world and God, yeah. but neither does Falling Planes. I would just hope that I wouldn't do something terrible. Yeah. Well, a lot of times in those kind of situations, I mean, I say those kind of situations, like that situation happens all the time, but you know, there's a lot of situations that you just, you don't know what you're going to do until you're in that situation. And then, yeah. like you said, you just hope that you do the right thing. I mean, I've been robbed at gunpoint before. I got robbed. I had a guy standing over me with a gun to the back of my head. And the only thing I could think of at that time, was you say, what are you going to do if you get robbed? Oh, I don't know. Well, what I did was I had one guy with me. We were closing a store. I never thought about myself one bit. I only thought about him. My job at that point was to make sure he didn't do anything stupid. That's all I could think about. They put zip ties on us and had us lay down. I just kept looking at him and I wasn't married. I had no children at the time. He was married. He had kids and I could see this fear in his eyes. And the only thing I kept looking at him and I just kept whispering, we're okay. We're okay. Just stay down. We're okay. You know? And when the guys left, he started to get up and I reached, I got my hands out of the zip ties and I reached over and I took him and I put him down on the floor and I was just like, let's let them go. That's not my money. I am not getting shot for someone else's money. Just let, let them go. And they got out. And of course, we had to do everything else. And then I started thinking about all these other situations later. What if I wasn't in the room when they came in? Because the other guy didn't know how to open the safe, right? And I had just come back from the restroom. What if I was still in the restroom when these three guys came in? Would I have gone to the office or would I have ducked out the back door and called the police? But if I do that, I'm leaving him alone with three guys and he doesn't know how to open a safe. Would they shoot him? There's just all these things that can go through your head in these situations. And you honestly don't really know unless you're in that situation. Yeah. So, you know. We're guessing from an emotionless state. Yeah. Right? Like we don't have all the chemicals running through our brains of that moment. And so we're trying to guess here with a level head. We wouldn't necessarily have a level head. If planes are falling from the sky. No, there would be a whole lot of emotion and a lot of a lot of stuff going on. I remember the emotion from 9-11. Yeah. And that was four planes. And you yeah. knew what was happening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just sitting there in that situation, it was just like, oh, crap. People were rushing to the gas station to get gas and going to get toilet paper and French toast supplies. And it's like. We got to be ready for the worst. And it was just kind of sat there and I was just like, I'm not sure exactly how to act, but I don't think panicking is the right way. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's about all I remember. It's like I went into yeah. work, nothing was happening, of course. So I just said, uh, let me go. And I went back home and just watched the news all day. But take that times a billion with all the planes falling down or whatever. I wouldn't even know what to think in that situation. No. And you, yeah, and like I said, these high stress situations, you really don't know what's going to happen until you're in that situation. And then your instinct just kind of takes, takes over on that one, I guess. Mm-hmm. Try to keep a cool head. It just dawns on me that this whole film, they're trying to figure out if God really wants this or if this is real. Nobody prays for mercy or anything or for God to not ask this of them. They just do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the four people, I mean, they showed up committed 100%. They're like, I don't want to die, but I'm going to. I think they were past the asking for God to step in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the waitress. That, that was heartbreaking watching her. She was really oh, good. She's, oh, I yeah. have a kid. I don't want to die, but I know I have to. And it's just like, you can save me. And they say no, and you just see her face. And then to find out she really did have a kid and everything. That was, that's rough. Yeah. But like you said, they knew going in, it's all or nothing. Yeah. I mean, they may have done their praying and stuff before they got to the cabin and all that time. And it just was, this is the answer. The answer is I have to do this. I read about M. Knight and I read some interviews on this film. And he did talk about what he wanted you to take away was that idea of living for a purpose greater than yourself, living for others, sacrificial love. That is, in his words, what he wanted you to be in awe of when you watch this film. So when you watch this ending, that's what he wants you to think about. So are you in awe? Because I also think, like we said earlier, that carries over to the four horsemen. Are you in awe of these people's faith? Oh, absolutely. How hard would it be to make that step? At some point, I would have to believe 
it was about to happen, I would allow somebody to shoot me, but I don't think I could ever go through with it. And again, you know, whatever those four saw that made them, especially Batista's character, Dave Batista, I mean, he had to do it to himself. Yeah. Like I said, I can't imagine even a small animal or, you know, anything like that, you know, working at a slaughterhouse or anything. I don't, I couldn't do anything like that to anything else, let alone me. And to have that kind of faith to say, this is it. Hopefully you make the right decision. Slice your throat. I think that's what he did. Mm -hmm. That's some serious, serious faith. I think you're probably right. I think I still struggled with, wait, this isn't the scenario, is it? Like, there's got to be some twist. There's got to be something. It's not really what it seems, but it wasn't. Like, That's, this was the scenario. I think that was the twist. That's that not, may yeah. have been it. Because Doug and I were used to, you know, you're used to an M. Night movie where there's some weird twist. And then it's like, oh, wow, I see this now. And we, you never got, you never got the Sixth Sense twist. You never got the, the signs twist or anything like that. And in a meta way, that is the twist because That's everyone twist was waiting is... for the twist to happen <laughs> and it just didn't. Yeah. It didn't happen. Right. If I could get over the scenario and the God that I know wouldn't ask this, then I'd have to say, yeah, I'm in awe of these people's faith because I couldn't do what they're doing here, probably. Do you want to know what the book ending was? I do know what the book ending is. I don't. Ooh, Drew, you want to tell us? Sure. So a couple differences in the book. In the book, the little girl gets shot and dies. There was the shootout where he went out and got his gun and he shot the nurse and the gun goes off and it actually shoots her and she dies. And they tell them that that's not good enough. Or they think it is for a while. They think that's going to end it. And then they tell them that's not good enough because it was accidental. You didn't sacrifice her. That was an accident that she died. She wasn't willing. Yeah, she wasn't a willing participant. So they have to ask the question to the two, you know, to the guys now. Are you going to do this? And in the end, they decide, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to spend the rest of our lives wandering the earth by ourselves. So they do. The final guy offs himself. The fire's coming down. Everything is blowing up around him. And the two of them take off. They get in the car and they drive. And that's the end of the book. A couple changes. Wow. So the little girl doesn't make it. They stay together. They decide not to end themselves. And the world ends. And they live eternity by themselves. One reason for one of those changes is nobody wanted to finance a movie where they shoot a kid on screen. Exactly. But also, when Paul Tremblay wrote that book, like I said, he was trying to explore the idea of what if God is evil. And so the end of that movie... That was supposed to be them saying, we would rather face the unknown, face our death, whatever, than worship an evil God who would ask us to kill a member of our family or or win the girl. Her sacrifice wasn't good enough. So that's kind of where he was coming from. And then M. Night changed that to be a celebration of faith, which I thought was interesting because Paul Tremblay said he did like the movie. He was surprised at some of the changes, and he wouldn't necessarily agree with them. One guy's telling the story as an unhealthy example of faith, and then M. Knight takes it, and he's telling the story as something we're supposed to be in awe of faith. So they're almost a dichotomy there. I, I almost would have thought that the author would have been, like, ticked. He did say there was a point where he almost wanted to, like, scream at the screen or run out of the theater, but overall liked it. So he wasn't without some discomfort with what M. Knight did. But I think he got permission because M. Knight would call him and tell him what he was thinking of doing. And Yeah. Interesting. Of yeah. course, it's, you know, it's how you look at it too, because they didn't really go into why God is asking this. I think they said that this has happened before. So if it's based on the book, then technically... The bad God won, and it's a sad ending, if that's the way he was portraying it. Yeah, are we supposed to be in awe of the couple in the book because they let the whole world die? Again, that's where it gets know. it gets a little dicey. I mean, <laughs> because it's, it's hard for us to think of an evil God. That's the thing, mm-hmm. you know. Our God is not evil. We don't believe that, and I don't think 
we ever will. So it's just hard to imagine that. But yes, I think if if you can just suspend reality, and this is a fantasy world where our God is not a forgiven God, he's an evil God, and he just likes playing, then yeah, I would say we'd have to be in all of that couple from the book that would rather just walk a barren land for eternity than to sacrifice somebody for an evil being. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, if the god was Moloch or Baal or one of those gods that did require a pagan sacrifice, if that's the scenario, then, well, maybe what the couple did by refusing to participate, maybe they are doing the right thing. You know, it all depends on which god it is that's in the seat of judgment here, right? Mm Mm-hmm. We received a comment on YouTube when we asked for things to talk about on this podcast. So here's a comment we received. Now, it is a little dicey, so we're going to do our best. Go easy on us. All right. (laughs) This is a good thought, though. Marlene Calero says she thought the movie was pretty good, but she just felt like it was kind of homophobic telling two gay people that they couldn't be together, like save their love or save the world. But overall, she liked the movie. She just had some discomfort with that ending. Now, I thought that was an interesting way to read the movie. And I wondered what you guys thought, because I can see how she sees that. I think M. Night almost backed himself into a corner when he rewrote the ending of the film, because the original ending, he he would have avoided the movie being read this way. Like, you've got this gay couple, they love each other, but they can't be together. I can see how she thinks that. I'm not sure... If M. Knight was really trying to say anything negative there, though, because he says their love is pure, and that pure love saves the world. So I don't know. How did you guys read this? I did not uh, honestly pick up on anything that I would have considered to be homophobic. The, I mean, the only reference to to that would have been, you know, the guy who beat him up in a bar earlier. I mean, they mm-hmm. established that that guy definitely was homophobic. I think at the end there where they have to choose the sacrifice and the two can't be together. I honestly did not see that any other way. That could have been a man and a woman standing there, you know, two women standing there, two men, whatever. And I think it would have played out the same way. I I, I didn't see that to be a homophobic statement. And I definitely don't think that M Knight intended it to be taken that way. I mean, that's just the way I saw it. I, I, I got the ending. It's two people who loved each other and they had to be separated because they had to make the sacrifice and it just happened to be two two men. Yeah, I think M. Knight was just trying to give a Hollywood ending to a already dark movie, mm-hmm. but a darker book. So he kind of is like, let's go ahead and save the world and let this couple save the world. I think that's where he was going with it. Now, you can take anything and put a twist on it and shake it up a little bit. I mean, technically that's what we do (laughs) in this channel is we look at things and say, well, what if we look at it this way? What if we look at it this way? So if you really wanted to break it down and play the evil God card in this, then yeah, you could also say, and this evil God doesn't like gay people. And that's why he chose these two. But like Drew said, it could have been a man and a woman there. I never would have thought of that unless somebody else commented. I think Doug was correct, too, to try to make it a little bit better of an ending. Because in the book, the little girl dies, and then they stay together, but they are completely alone in a devastated world. Whereas in the movie, the little girl lives. And remember, he was talking, saying, I have a vision of her. She grows up. She'll get married, and she'll have children, and you'll get to experience this. He made the sacrifice almost more for his husband and daughter than he did for the rest of the world i think that's pretty powerful so yeah i think the ending that m night picked was probably a, even though it's still dark a little happier ending i think that was a show of actual real powerful love between the two of them also yeah i think to marlene's credit i think she's right that the ending is unfair for them oh yes because they had such a hard time through the film i mean they were abused by other people like repeatedly i mean you saw three points in this film where family or the people they were trying to adopt 
the place they were trying to get win. And then in the bar, I mean, you saw them repeatedly abused. So you see how hard it is, what they have to endure to stay together. And then at the end, they can't be together. So yeah, I could, I can understand how she would see that because what happens to them is like brutally unfair. And that would almost play into maybe Paul Tremblay's idea. What if God is evil? Is that what they're going through? You know, one of them has faith and the other is struggling with that idea. But I do think where I think M. Night is coming from is he wants us to have compassion for them because of the way he's betrayed them. He's done a good job, I think, of making us feel their pain earlier in the film. Mm -hmm. I felt bad for what they went through. And I do think the movie does a good job of showing you, I believe, like the gay people that I know, I think they were mistreated far worse than anybody else I know in high school. And so they kind of make you feel that through the movie. So that that makes me think I'll give M. Night the benefit of the doubt that he's not trying to say anything negative about gay people. It's just an unfortunate part of the story. It's just unfair for them what they go through in the story. Yeah. I think all in all, you just got to remember, this is not a movie pushing religion. This is not a movie trying to say God is good. This is, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is a fictional movie. And, you know, I mean, if you really want to look at it from the book perspective, you can be like, oh, well, they were selfish and didn't think about the rest of the world. So, you know, they're saying that gay people are selfish now, you know, so you can twist the book in that way, too, which I wouldn't. But I'm saying you can. Right. It could have just as easily been a man and a woman. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or what I'm saying is, you know, you can look at the book being negative against gay people because the gay people sacrificed the entire world so they could live. I don't believe that. It's obvious that he's not saying that. You know, it brings discussion, conversation. That's a good thing. Yeah. And she still liked the film. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. And that's, yeah. That's, that's the biggest thing to take away from it is, you know, we can have discussions about it, but it's nothing to get that upset about. Unless they're blatantly. (laughs) Yeah, if it was blatant. (laughs) Yeah. I do think that this book or movie or both likely had the goal to try to make us sympathize with what gay people go through and like how they're hazed by other people, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I personally saw that consistently enough in the film that I think they were trying to get us to do that, which I think can be a good thing, you know, to be able to sympathize because I do think they're mistreated by a lot of people. Yeah. Just because I've seen it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we grew up in the Midwest. Of course we saw it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some of the things I saw in high school were not the best, you know. Well, thank you for your comment, by the way. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Makes for good discussion. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to hear more spiritual themes in movies, then subscribe to this channel, like this video or podcast, and we will be back with our next episode where we go even deeper into the spiritual themes behind this film. We'll see you next time.